Well, I want to welcome those that are watching online. I also want to welcome all of you that are here today. Um, I hope these really short hero videos have been helpful for you. Because what we really wanted you to do is we wanted you to realize uh, the people that you're sitting next to on Sundays and to see people across all of our campuses and all of our services and realize that every single week you are surrounded by people that are unsung heroes. And so we hope we've helped with that. Uh, I want you to turn to Judges chapter 13. Two more weeks and we're done with our hero series. I'm sorry. I'm going to wind it down by telling you the story of our last hero. And uh, while you're turning there, I have a confession to make. This is unfortunately a confession that is highly embarrassing to my wife. But I am very proud of it. And it is that I am a comic book geek. I have always been a comic book geek. Uh, I have boxes of comic books in my garage. I liked Wolverine before it was cool to like Wolverine. I enjoy uh, watching comic book movies. But most of all, I enjoy bantering about the comic book movie afterwards, comparing it to its source material. Uh, much to my wife's embarrassment, I still read and collect comic books. And I'm very proud of it. Uh, I want to let you know that one of my favorite comic book heroes is The Incredible Hulk. Now, I love the Hulk because the Hulk is the ultimate anti-hero. Sometimes if you followed the, the story arc of the Hulk, you know that sometimes the Hulk is a good guy. Sometimes he's a bad guy. But most of the time, even when he's a good guy, it's debatable how much benefit he's actually providing. So he's the ultimate Anti-hero. Unfortunately, most of you, the only thing you know about the Incredible Hulk is what Hollywood has taught you. Maybe you used to watch that old 70s TV show, The Incredible Hulk. Remember that? You had mild-mannered Bruce Banner, and then people would pick on him, and he would say that famous line, Don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. And then he would turn into that big, huge, green Lou Ferrigno, Hulk guy, throw cars everywhere. Uh, or, you know, what you've seen from the Marvel movies. But for those of you that are like me, and you are a comic book geek, you know how complex Hulk is. You know, first off, that uh, Hulk, the more angry he gets, the bigger he gets. And we don't even know how strong the Hulk can actually be because no one's been around and survived long enough to make him angry enough to see how big he can get. Um, also, for those of you that are comic book geeks, you know that eventually Hulk became such a threat to mankind that a group of superheroes, this is totally geeking out for you, a group of superheroes called the Illuminati, which included Professor X, Doctor Strange, Tony Stark, um, uh, a couple other guys, they thought he is a, uh, he's harmful to humans, so they tricked him, got him on a spaceship, sent him to a distant universe, and banished him to a planet there. But if you know the arc of the Hulk, he eventually makes it back to Earth. It's a, it's a comic book series called World War Hulk. He takes over the world, basically. He eventually is ruling with his children. It's a comic book. The entire West Coast of the United States. And that actually leads to a, a big confrontation that he has with Wolverine. There's a new movie out called Logan that is based on this comic book <laughs> called Old Man Logan. It is very loosely based on Old Man Logan. I won't tell you the end of the actual movie Logan, but I'll tell you how it ended in the comic book, which is radically different. So eventually, uh, Wolverine is the only superhero left. He's living in an area that is dominated by the Hulk and his kids. And it leads to a big, huge fight between Wolverine and Hulk. So Wolverine would slash Hulk, make him mad. Hulk would beat up Wolverine. Wolverine can't die, so he'd regenerate. Eventually, he makes Hulk so mad. And Hulk is so big that he grabs Wolverine, swallows him, and eats him. 
It's a comic book. But Wolverine can't die. So about eight hours later, he regenerates in Hulk's, Hulk's stomach and he bursts out of Hulk's stomach and kills him. Seriously, when you go home, people say, hey, would you learn at church? You get something that you never expect you would learn. Why did I tell you all of this? Because uh, the last hero that we're going to look at in Judges reminds me of the Hulk. He is the ultimate anti-hero. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if Stan Lee created the Hulk after reading Judges 13. So Judges 13, verse 1. Here we go again. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. I want to ask everyone to bow your heads, close your eyes. Repeat this prayer after me. Everybody say, Dear Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I'm going to get as far as I can today, and I'm going to finish this story up next week. But there's a couple things I want to point out from this first verse. Uh, the first thing is, you notice what it's missing. You see, every single week, we introduced you to the cycle by saying, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They were given over to their enemies. They were captured, became slaves, were subdued by their enemies for a number of years. And then it always followed up with, and they cried out to the Lord for help. Did you notice that that is missing from this story? Uh, it doesn't really tell us why, but I'm going to give you the Brandon commentary version. I think it's because after 40 years of being subdued by the Philistines, they'd given up all hope. You see, what we know about the Philistines, most of you are aware of the most famous Philistine, Goliath, who David killed later on in life. Um, but the Philistines were large. They were seen by many of their adversaries as giants. The Philistines were known to be incredibly aggressive and violent. They were warmongers. And for 40 years, the Israelites were under the submission of the Philistines. Then the Bible says, A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites. Say that five times fast. Uh, clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. Okay, so let's start with by explaining that she was barren. And uh, as a pastor, I have worked through infertility with many families in our church. And if you have had a friend or a loved one that's ever struggled with infertility, you know what a challenge that can be and how hurtful that can be for their family. In this culture, in particular, if you were a woman, uh, the main thing that you looked forward to was raising your children, having children. And so when it tells us that Manoah uh, had a wife and she was barren, you can imagine how hurtful this was for their family, how devastating it was, that it was something that they really were challenged with. And then it says, verse 3, that the angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are barren and childless, but you're going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. So whenever we've talked about it, whenever the Bible refers to in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, that that is the physical manifestation of Christ in the Old Testament. So Jesus appears to this woman on a mission. And he gives her an if-then promise. Have you noticed that the Bible is full of these if-then promises? Meaning this, that if you do this, then God will do this. It happens over and over again. God will challenge you and he'll say, if you do this, here's what I'll do. And he says to this woman that if you will live as a Nazarite, and if you will agree to raise your child as a Nazarite, then I will bless you with a son. And if then promise. Well, you need to understand what a Nazarite vow was. In Numbers chapter 6, it describes what a Nazarite vow. It was uh, 
first thing you would do is you were not allowed to cut your hair. The second thing is you were not allowed to drink wine or eat grapes. You had to avoid any appearance of evil or compromise. And finally, the Nazarite vow, you were to avoid any contact with anything that was dead. So what is the Nazarite vow? Basically, a Nazarite vow is for a season or period you would set yourself apart. You would say, uh, I'm going to not do these things and I'm going to deny myself these things so that I can have this new spiritual dynamic inside of me. You know, we do that today. Like oftentimes, um, if we need something from God, we will fast for a season. In fact, some of you right now, you are in the middle of Lent. You're gearing up for Easter that you are fasting something and you're fasting specifically. Maybe it's because there's some loved ones that you want to invite to church on Easter. And so you are fasting leading up to that moment so that you can invite them. Uh, maybe for some of you, you've had financial struggles in your life. So what you have done is... You have set yourself apart and fasted, believing for a miracle in your business or a breakthrough in your finances or maybe a new job. So we understand setting ourselves apart for a season for a purpose. Now, um, as a minister, I have to do this all the time, that there are many things that I do not have an issue with at all. That I don't have a theological issue with. I don't have a social issue with. But I choose to deny myself of uh, for the sake of ministry. For the sake of setting myself apart. Like one of the, uh, an example is I don't drink. I don't drink alcohol. I don't have a theological issue with alcohol. I don't have a social issue with alcohol. I realize that most of you that are over the age of 21, you drink. I do not have a problem with that. I do have a problem if you drink too much. But I also ask my staff, as a covenant that they make with me to be on my staff as a pastor, that they also abstain from alcohol too. Now, I don't do that because I think there's anything wrong with drinking. I do that because I understand that there are people in the church that have an issue with pastors drinking. And so I ask my staff to not drink for one reason. I don't want more meetings. That's honestly what it boils down to. There are so many people that are lost and hurting in this community that what I do not want to do is waste time having to meet with people to argue for my staff to have the right to drink. It is a waste of my time. It is a simple denial of self for this amazing privilege that we are given to be a pastor. So I understand what like making the vow of a Nazarite is like, setting yourself apart is like. But here was here's what was unique about this story is that not only was she for a season to set herself apart, but she was required to raise her son and he was to live his entire life as a Nazarite. So here's the end. So it's an if then promise. Verse 24. It says the woman gave birth to a boy. And named him Samson. He grew. And the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord. Began to stir. In him. So she has a son. Samson. Samson. Is the ultimate. Anti-hero. The Bible tells us that God began to bless him at a young age. Now, it doesn't tell us what that means, but you can assume. Have you ever seen just kind of that kid who is just charmed? Everything works out for them. It seems like everything they touch turns to gold. But my favorite part about Samson is that it tells us that the spirit of the Lord began to stir in him. Now, We've talked about this often when it says the spirit of the Lord began to stir. It's referring to the anointing that God's anointing would supernaturally come upon Samson. And I've described the anointing many times to you. It, it, the anointing is when God gives you supernatural ability, supernatural strength, supernatural favor to accomplish a task that he has called you to. It's this understanding that if God calls us to it, he provides the dynamics so that we can do it. Now, Samson was unique because Samson is a study in contrast. 
Samson had huge strengths and even bigger weaknesses. Samson had enormous victories and embarrassingly bad defeats. I like to refer to Samson as the he-man who had a she weakness. <laughs> Samson is this man who is mightily anointed by God to do extraordinary things. And I think it's safe to say that out of all of the heroes that we've studied in Judges, Samson had the most potential. I mean, he had the most ability to make the greatest difference. God used him and he didn't even need any help. He could do it all by himself. And the problem is this man who was mightily anointed by God had a weakness for Philistine women. Judges 14 says, Samson went down to Timnah and on his way saw there a young Philistine woman. You're going to see later on that Samson is like a one-man army. But it's almost shocking that this guy who is a one-man army is brought down over and over again by one wayward woman. When he returned, he said to his parents, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now go get her for me as my wife. Uh, He he says, I I saw a woman, love at first sight, I want to marry her dad. And her dad immediately tries to talk some sense into him. He says, Samson, she's a Philistine. She doesn't share your faith. Can't you find a wife amongst all of our people? Can't you find a wife amongst all of the Israelites? There's a, there's a verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. Uh, you've heard it before. You've heard it quoted many times, especially if you grew up in a youth ministry. And it says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Now, I I, want to tell you, when Paul gives us that advice and Samson's parents are saying, you shouldn't uh, marry someone who doesn't share your faith, he's not saying that because unbelievers are unlovable. In fact, I would say that sometimes unbelievers are more lovable than you people. He didn't say it because they're not worthy of being loved. He didn't say it because they're not valuable or they're not good enough. He was saying it and giving them this advice because if you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you accept that title, then the most important thing in your life should be Jesus. That Jesus, that relationship, it sets your values. It, 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 it sets your goals. It, it actually describes the way that you're going to raise children. And I want to tell you, church, marriage, it is hard. Okay? And if you want to start out a marriage not agreeing on what is the most important thing, you are setting yourself up for failure. So when people challenge you, You shouldn't date someone who doesn't share your faith. They're not trying to be like some old school fuddy-duddy. How did I just say that? (laughs) Wow. Um, You know what they're trying to do is they're trying to keep you from falling in love with someone you shouldn't. So Samson's parents try to talk some sense into him, say, um, you, you shouldn't marry this woman. You should find someone who shares your faith. And Samson says, which I've heard as a youth pastor, I've heard it as a pastor of a church full of young adults, but mom, dad, she's the right one for me. This is code for, dad, you're so old school. Man, you don't get it. I'm going to be fine. Do you know how many of my former youth students have made this mistake? And they have always based upon, I am the exception to the rule. You just wait till you have kids. You just wait till how complicated marriage is going to be when you have kids. And you want to raise your kids differently. Uh, The actual translation of that verse is Samson said to his parents, she's right in my eyes. So you know what he was actually saying? He was saying, dude, dad, she's hot. There ain't no one in Israel that looks like her. Get her for my wife. Well, his parents eventually 
give in and uh, it's kind of like the process of a wedding here. It's kind of fun. So the next thing you see is the proposal um, and it's uh, verse 5 of chapter 14. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. And as they approached the vineyards of Timnah, what is Samson? A Nazarite. What is Samson's not supposed to be around? Grapes. Samson was impulsive. Samson was prone to indulgence. Samson loved to flirt with compromise. And here he is thinking, it's a shortcut through the vineyard. I'm going through the vineyard. And what happens next is that a young lion came roaring toward him. And the Bible says that the spirit of the Lord came upon powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. Samson was impulsive. He was prone to indulgence. He flirted with compromise. But even though he did that, God still blessed him. God still used him. The spirit of the Lord still came upon him. Remember the very first message in the series, I described the umbrella of grace. I pulled out an umbrella. And I said, within that, God allows you to maneuver and avoid the storm. He said, you can trip and make mistakes and mess up. And God will still bless you. And in basically what he doesn't do is he doesn't let you reap the consequences of your actions. He still protects you. You don't deal with the end result of your actual choices. But if you flirt with the edge of that umbrella and step outside of it, the full force of the storm hits you. You reap the natural results of your mistakes and of your actions and your decisions. But God still blessed him. Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Lion comes, grabs the lion, rips it apart. And the Bible says, as you or I would a young goat. Any of you ripping apart a young goat? (laughs) Whoever is the goat ripper in here, please go to the church down the street. No goat rippers at Canyon Creek. Uh, A little bit later, it's now wedding week. So a wedding week in the Hebrew culture lasted an entire seven days. So you would get married and then you would party basically for seven days. So he's once again leaving his town and he's heading down to the Philistine village of Timnah. And it says sometime later when he went back to marry her, he turned aside to see, uh, to look at the lion's carcass. And in it, he saw a swarm of bees and some honey. So uh, eventually he's heading down to the wedding, uh, thinks on it to do the shortcut through the vineyard again, walks through the vineyard, and he looks over, and what does he see? The decomposed lion carcass. And he thinks, I did that. But he notices bees flying around, and he thinks, wherever there's bees, there's honey. And so Samson looks around, reaches into that dead carcass. Who is Samson? A Nazarite. What is he not supposed to do? Touch things that are dead. But Samson is prone to indulgence. Samson flirts with compromise. And he reaches in. And he grabs the honey from that dead lion carcass. Which is nasty to begin with. And he eats it. And he thinks, dang, that is good. I'm going to get some from my parents. And so he gets some more. Gives it to his parents. His parents eat it. But the Bible says, but he didn't tell them where it came from. Because Samson was thinking, what mom and dad don't know won't hurt them. Have you ever said that one before? My parents won't know won't hurt them. How about this one? What my wife doesn't know won't hurt her. Man, as long as she doesn't know what I'm doing, it won't hurt anybody. Let me warn you. That if you flirt with fire, you will eventually get burned. So next up, what do you have to have during a, right before a wedding? Every guy has to have a bachelor party. But because Samson wasn't amongst his people, he was amongst the Philistines. He didn't have any friends there. One of my favorite things about Canyon Creek is that we have weddings all the time. I mean, up to sometimes two, three, four weddings in a month, right? And I see this happen Over and over and over again. The girls in our church, they always want seven bridesmaids. 
Seven or eight. They want lots of bridesmaids. The problem is the guy only has like two or three friends. So he doesn't have enough groomsmen. So eventually a bunch of his groomsmen are like the bride's friends. So, uh, one of my favorite things is at our church, Morgan Butcher has been in like 25 weddings. He gets asked to be in everybody's wedding. He'll tell me about a wedding that he's in and I'll say, do you even know that person? I've never talked to them once, but I'm in their wedding. I think he likes buying tuxes and, and things like that. So, uh, they're there. She thinks, well, he doesn't have any friends. So she finds 30 of her guy friends to throw him a bachelor party. And in the middle of this bachelor party, Samson's a fun guy. What do guys do at bachelor party? They like to gamble a little bit. And so Samson says, all right, I'm going to make you a bet. I'm going to tell you a riddle. And if you can guess this riddle, I will buy each one of you a brand new outfit. He said, but if you go the entire wedding week without uh, solving the riddle, you guys together have to buy me 30 new outfits. And so he shares the riddle. He says, out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. And the Bible says for three days, they couldn't figure it out. And they eventually decided, we're going to go find out from his wife. And so they go to their friend and they threaten her. They say, you've got to find out from Samson the answer to this riddle. If you don't find out the answer to this riddle, we'll not only kill you, they're great friends, but we will kill your family. So she goes over to Samson and says, why haven't you told me the answer to this riddle? Samson's like, I ain't telling you, it's a secret. And so the Bible says that she threw herself at Samson, that she cried and begged and nagged him for a week to tell her. What did I tell you? Samson is the he-man with a she-weakness. Eventually, one Philistine woman brings him down. And so he can't handle it anymore. And so he tells her the answer to the riddle. She immediately leaves and runs over and tells the 30 guys. So at the end of the week, Samson's ready to get paid. And he said, all right, pay up. And then they answered the riddle by saying, what is sweeter than honey... What is stronger than a lion? And Samson knows he was betrayed by his wife. And he says something that I'd never encourage any man to ever, ever, ever say. He looks at all of them and he says, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. And then the Bible says that once again... The spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. He went down to Ashkelon and he struck down 30 Philistines, stripped them of their clothes, took their clothes back to these 30 men and paid his debt. But the problem was Samson was furious. So rather than go to his wife, he went to his parents' home instead. So he went, left Timna, went back home, probably thinking until I cool down. But what does the Bible say? It says, uh, Samson's wife was then given to one of his companions who had attended him at the feast. Well, after Samson calms down sometime later, he thinks, all right, I'm time to, time to go to my wife. Time to like reconcile our relationship and begin our family. So he goes to like the local central market and he buys flowers, actually goes and gets a goat. And he goes back to her town, sees her dad, and says, uh, I'm going to my wife's room. And her dad says, I can't let you in. I was so sure you hated her that I gave her to your companion. And then he says, like a real fatherly thing, he says, isn't her younger sister more attractive? Take her instead. (laughs) Samson then does what I think is like, the most immature, silly, kind of like college prank you would ever see. He's so upset with the Philistines that he goes out and he rounds up 300 foxes. And then he takes them and he ties them together two by two by their tails and attaches a torch to each one of their tails. I I always think when I read this, not one of his friends said, isn't there a more mature way for you to handle this? And then... He lights those torches and sets the foxes free 
in the Philistines' fields. And so they run around burning up olive fields and vineyards and wheat fields. And the Philistines find out it was Samson who did this. Remember that they were ruling over the Israelites. And so now the Philistines, they have had it. So they go to the leaders of Israel and they say, this Samson guy is a serious issue for us. He's a bit too impulsive. He's a tad violent. Okay, if you don't take care of Samson, we'll take care of him. And then, by the way, that will force us to take care of you. So the Bible says that 3,000 Israelites went to Samson. And they basically said to him, dude, what are you doing? You are not helping us with the Philistines. And Samson says to them, please don't kill me. You guys don't kill me. I will go peacefully and allow you to hand me over to the Philistines. So the Bible says that they tied Samson up with two brand new ropes. You see, they used two brand new ropes because older ropes were easy to break. But it was believed that two brand new ropes was nearly unbreakable. So they tied him up, these 3,000 Israelites, and they brought him to the Philistine army. And as Samson approached the Philistine army, um, the, the Philistines began to charge Samson. Bible says that they were shouting at Samson. You can picture it was probably like, we've had enough of you. Let's kill this guy. Let's go get him. And then the Bible says that the spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. I think it probably went like this. Samson's thinking, you don't want to make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. And the Bible says that he snapped those two ropes And then he began to look around and he found the only thing he could grab that was close, a donkey jawbone. And Samson, as the Philistines are charging him by himself, he charges the Philistines with a donkey jawbone and he kills 1000 Philistines single handedly with a donkey jawbone. Uh, I want to read one more verse, and then I'm going to say, to be continued. Verse 20. Samson then led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Samson is the he-man with a she-weakness. A man who could have done extraordinary things, but you're going to find out next week what ultimately brought him down. Everybody bow your heads, close your eyes. Lord Jesus, I thank you for our church. And as I share this two-part message this week, I want everyone to leave thinking one thing. That if I flirt with fire, I will eventually get burned. If there are people here and they have been flirting with compromise, I pray that that haunts them all week long. That if I flirt with fire, I will eventually get burned. In Jesus' name, amen.